Hey everybody, this is Rust from Retro Game Core. Today we're going to look at another mini PC. This one comes from Minis Forum. It is called the NUC XI5. Now this review is going to be a little bit unique because this is the first PC that I've tested that actually has its own graphics card. In fact, as you'll see in our teardown, just the overall design of this feels a lot like the bottom half of a laptop just propped up with this nice sturdy metal stand. Now in the box you're going to find your typical stuff, you know, an HDMI cable as well as a 230 watt power brick. Now given the fact that it has its own graphics card, I'm really interested to see how much performance we can actually get out of it. And while Minis Forum is known for making small form factor PCs, I'm hesitant to call this one an actual mini PC. In fact, around the house I've been referring to this one as a MIDI PC. But thanks to its vertical design, it does have a pretty small footprint. Now I've been testing this PC pretty heavily, I've actually been using it as my main PC for nearly a month at this point. And so I think it's time to do a deep dive review of the Minis Forum NUC XI5 and see if it's going to be worth its asking price. Okay, let's start with some specs. Now this actually comes with two different models, there is an i7 version as well as an i5. The i7 version has more cores and threads and uses a GeForce RTX 3070. The i5 model, which is the one I'm testing, has 6 cores, 12 threads, and then runs the RTX 3060. And you can see the rest of the specs here, but I do want to call attention to the fact that it has a Thunderbolt 4 port on the back, as well as HDMI 2.1. And the model I'm testing has the standard 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of storage, but you could upgrade that if you'd like. Now, as far as pricing, the i5 model that I'm testing is $980 in its pre-release form. That being said, it's currently sold out. I'm not sure if they're going to restock before the actual retail release. And the i7 version is just under $200 more for that upgraded CPU as well as the 3070. And both the CPU and GPU upgrades here are quite significant for that price point. Personally, if I was going to buy one of these models, I would definitely go with the i7 simply because it's going to last a lot longer thanks to those upgraded specs. So now let's take a closer look at the device itself and the I.O. Up top we have a power button and then also a fan control. You can toggle this between having max fan in the game mode or the balance mode. The power button also functions as a sleep button if you just tap on it. On the bottom of the front here we have three USB 3.2 ports, a headphone microphone jack, and an SD card slot. Up top we have an exhaust for one of the two fans inside. And then on the back we have the power adapter, 2.5 gigabit ethernet, HDMI 3.1, and then that Thunderbolt 4. We also have two additional exhaust vents for the fans. And the right side of the device, as you can see here, is just one big piece of ventilation. Now I had already mounted it to the base here, so I'm going to remove these big long screws, which are what held it in place. Underneath that, there are three small screws and that's it. The clips here are pretty solid, but you basically just grab from the bottom of the device and pop it right open. And so this is what it looks like inside. And yeah, this is almost a dead ringer to a laptop here. We have a dual fan setup and then five heat pipes. And you can also see the ribbons here that they're using to connect the I.O. to the front panel. In terms of upgrades, all there is here is an additional M.2 slot. So if you wanted additional storage, you would just throw in an additional 2280 stick right here. And I'm really curious to find out how Minis Forum put this whole thing together, because if you look here at some of these ports, these are connection ports for things like a battery or a monitor for a laptop. And so I think it may be that they repurposed a laptop motherboard for this device. Either way, yes, if you tear your device down, you will see a bunch of connection ports that don't actually go anywhere. In terms of RAM, I have two 8GB DDR4 RAM sticks that are rated to 3200 MHz. The solid state drive here that came with my device is a Fison brand 512GB. But yeah, that's about it for the teardown. As you can see, there's a lot of empty space here on the mini PC, and I wish they had left a slot right here for a two and a half inch SATA hard drive. I think it would have been really handy to be able to put in some cheap storage right there. Okay, now let's do some size comparisons. First, we have my micro ATX PC that I built in early 2020. And here are the specs for it, and it cost me about $1,000 altogether to put everything together. I did a little bit of shopping here today, and nowadays with the graphics cards going down, you can get one of these for about $715 with brand new parts. So essentially, this PC could be built for about $200 less than the NUC XI5. But of course, even though this is a micro ATX case, this is much larger than the Minis Forum PC we're reviewing today. 
Now, it's not quite a direct comparison between these two PCs in terms of performance, but just to give you a baseline here, the Ryzen chip that I'm using inside of the larger PC is about 12% faster. And that likely has to do with the additional amounts of cores and threads compared to the Intel one. But once we get over to the graphics cards, you can see that the NVIDIA RTX 3060 is about 50% faster than the old RX 590 that I have in my old PC. So I think in terms of gaming performance, yes, even though this one is $200 more than the larger PC, you're actually going to get better gaming performance across the board. And the fact that you can get that much performance on something so thin is pretty awesome. Now, there are some other competitors in this space. For example, there's the new Minis Forum Neptune series that's coming out, and I just got this one in the mail, and I'll be doing a review on this one next. This one is also pretty large when it comes to mini PCs, but this also has a graphics card inside. So I'm really excited about testing this one off, and it'll be my next mini PC review video. And just in terms of helping with the scale, here's a typical sized Minis Forum PC right here. So yes, as you can see, the word Mini PC has some varying sizes to it, and the typical one is the smallest here, but I don't think the other ones are that big. That being said, the micro ATX case of my regular PC just looks massive by comparison. And really, that's kind of the crux of the issue right here, is how much desk space you have and what you're willing to live with. Of course, there will always be concessions for making a smaller PC. It's either going to be price or performance. But in terms of the NUC XI5, I think we're getting some really excellent performance and still keeping a pretty relatively small size. And so here it is in my very cluttered desk setup right here that I used for the past month. Next to it is a 14 inch MacBook Pro that I use for all my video editing. And as you can see, it kind of slides right in. Yes, it's tall, but it does fit in there pretty nicely. It's a lot like a laptop that is sitting up vertically. And in reality, this is about the same size as a PS5 in terms of the overall height. Obviously, it's not as thick, but you can see my PS5 here hiding in the background, and yeah, they're about the same size. And since this reminds me so much of vertically oriented laptops, I did decide to compare that against some of the others on the market. And so here you can see is the cheapest laptop that I could find with the exact same specs as the mini PC. And as you can see, this Gigabyte G5 is about $200 more than the Minis Forum one that we're testing. Now, of course, with that extra $200, you are getting more functionality. After all, this has its own built-in display and a keyboard and trackpad. And so obviously, if you're looking to use this a little bit more portably, then a laptop might be a better choice. And same story with the cheapest i7 model that I found. This is about $200 more, but again, it has its own display, keyboard, and trackpad. In fact, this display goes up to 240 hertz, which is pretty awesome. And so if you want that additional functionality of having the portability, then obviously a laptop's probably going to be a better choice, but it will come at a price premium. Okay, I think we've done enough comparisons at this point. Let's actually get into what this PC can do. I don't usually spend a lot of time with benchmarks, but I did run Time Spy here in 3D Mark, and this is the rating right here. And as you can see, the estimated game performance for some of these typical AAA titles is pretty good. And of course, we'll do real world testing with some of these games here in a minute. Now, I also ran a Cinebench test here, and as you can see, at 100% max load, we're getting about 65 to 70 watts of CPU draw. And the Cinebench score was 9685, and that kind of makes sense to me. This is only an i5 with 6 cores and 12 threads. But I think this score would be just fine when it came to some light video editing at around the 1080p space. So let's now dive into the gaming side of things. Usually I will start with the very easy games like Celeste and then move my way up, but because we're working with a dedicated graphics card, we're just gonna jump up to the big stuff here in the beginning. And so in my testing, I used everything at 4K and then I pushed up the graphical fidelity as high as I could. In some games, I would get a little bit of screen tearing because of my capture card, so sometimes I would turn on V-Sync like here with Bioshock Infinite. And so yeah, in many of the games that I tested, I could push it to 4K and then also the highest settings that I could find and I was still getting a great frame rate. Or at the very least, I could get it locked in at 60 frames per second and it looked wonderful. When it came to competitive shooters, I did try Counter-Strike Go at the default high settings and I was getting about 141 frames per second. Other games like Grand Theft Auto V, I kept at 4K but then pushed it up to high and I was getting around 80 frames per second on average. Same thing with Doom Eternal, 4K high settings, and I was getting over 60 frames. At this point, I would probably just lock it at 60, or you could reduce it down to 1440p if you wanted a higher frame rate. Now, the only way I could get 60 frames per second with control is to drop it down to a 1080p rendering, but then also keep these settings on high. 
I honestly think this game is probably not very well optimized because 1440p or 4K would drop it down to about 40 frames per second. Meanwhile, something like God of War could play at 4K and on high settings and still get well over 60 frames. In fact, I found that about 75 or 80 frames was the average, and this game just looks gorgeous here on the screen. You'll probably lose some of these details when YouTube squashes my video for its compression, but man, this looks beautiful to me right now. Hellblade is another one that I had to lower down to 1080p at very high settings, and there I got a pretty stable 60 frames per second. It would dip down here and there, but overall it was a smooth gameplay experience. For Red Dead Redemption 2, I found that 1440p and balanced settings gave me the best performance. I'd say the average here is about 55 frames per second, so not quite 60 stable, but still pretty close. And definitely a smooth and enjoyable gameplay experience too. If I wanted to play Witcher 3 at 4K, then I had to drop it down to medium settings, and even then it would sometimes dip to around 50-55 frames per second. So for this game, I think it's probably better to play it in 1080p or 1440p, and then boost up the graphical fidelity there. But yeah, at the end of the day, I think the PC gaming performance here is excellent. Every single game I tried just ran beautifully. The only configuration I did was to increase the graphics to make it look even better. Now let's talk about emulation. We're going to start right with the heavy hitting systems first. On GameCube, I upped it to a 6x resolution, which is a little bit more than 4K. And I'm happy to say that every single GameCube game I tried played perfectly. Even the hard ones to play, like Rogue Squadron 2, were 60 frames per second, no problem, even at a 6x resolution. So yes, when it comes to GameCube and Wii, this is the ultimate gaming machine. You can just set it to a 4K resolution and just have fun. And same story with PS2. We're also running at a 6x resolution, and no matter what game I played, it played at full speed. So of course, things like Ratchet & Clank or Grand Theft Auto, they're going to work just fine. But what surprised me the most was that God of War 2 played at full speed, and even some of the games that are harder to run than God of War 2, like Champions of Norrath. This was running wonderfully. Now, the original Xbox emulator did not perform as well as PS2 and GameCube. For this one, I dropped it down to a 4X resolution, but still, even then, many games played well. The biggest limitation here is going to be the compatibility with this emulator, which is not the best. But if there's a game that runs well on this emulator, it's going to run well on this PC. Other games that don't run as well on this emulator, like Halo 2, yeah, they're going to have some dips in performance. But even though this can't keep a stable 60 frames with Halo 2, it's still the best I've ever seen with this game on this emulator. So in the end, Xbox emulation is not going to be perfect, but it's pretty close. Okay, next we're going to move over to Wii U. I went into the graphics pack settings here and I upped everything to 4K for these games as well. And just like with GameCube and PS2, this ran flawlessly. I was getting full frame rates for games like Mario Kart 8 and Legend of Zelda Wind Waker. And I was happy to see that Breath of the Wild played at 4K no problem too. Every once in a while it would dip down to maybe 59 or 58 frames per second, but I never actually felt any difference when I was actually playing. So my recommendation here would be to set it to 4K in the graphics pack settings and then also limit the frame rate to 60 frames. And then I would just turn off the frame rate counter and then just enjoy Breath of the Wild in 4K. It looks amazing. Next up, I tried a little bit in Nintendo 3DS. For this one, I did a 4X resolution. And I'll say that this one did okay for most games. Things like Ocarina of Time 3D and Ridge Racer were relatively stable at around 55 to 60 frames per second. However, there were some games that struggled with this emulator even at just a 4X resolution. Super Mario 3D Land is a good example. At times, this would dip down to the mid-50s. The gameplay was still solid, but not quite a stable 60 frames. In terms of PS3 gameplay, it was relatively good as well. For all the games I tried, I was able to get a solid frame rate at the native resolution. Unfortunately, when I tried to increase the resolution, it would result in poor performance. And that makes sense because PS3 in particular prefers to have a lot of cores and threads. And given the fact that we're only working with 6 and 12 here, I can see why it's not going to perform perfectly. But I think if you keep it at the native resolution, it'll be just fine. And if you shell out a little bit more for the i7 model, I bet you would get even better performance performance at a 2x resolution here with PS3. Either way, many of the games like Prince of Persia that struggle to do a full frame rate when you get to these larger areas was still just fine. And this is the first time I've ever seen Metal Gear Solid Ground Zeroes running at over 30 frames per second. So I would say PS3 emulation on this machine is great, but not quite perfect. 
Moving over to Xbox 360, this one also played pretty well with the Xenia emulator. In fact, I just did a video a couple weeks ago about this emulator and I actually used this mini PC for all of my testing. So if you want a longer showcase of Xbox 360 emulation on this machine, I would recommend checking out that video, which I'll leave in the description. And last system I want to test here is Nintendo Switch. For all these games, I'm running it in docked mode, which can be either 1080p or 720p depending on the game. But as you can see here, these games are running wonderfully here in Yuzu. And I'm only showing off the heavier hitting Switch games, but as you can see, they are relatively stable. There are some moments where it will dip down to less than the ideal frame rate, but even then the gameplay is still nice and smooth. And so if you're looking for a machine to emulate Nintendo Switch, this is going to be really great even when running in docked mode. So yeah, when it comes to emulation, I'm super happy with this device. Everything that I threw at it was at a playable speed. There was nothing that I thought to myself, well, this isn't very good. Okay, so I think that's enough testing to really show what this device can do. Now let's actually talk about what I think about it. In terms of what I like, I think the performance speaks for itself. Every single game I tried, either on the PC or through emulation, ran really well. And as you saw, most of these games ran at 4K, no problem. It's also in that emulation sweet spot where everything just works. You don't have to fiddle with the settings, you just have to load up your game and just start playing. I also appreciate the small footprint of this device. It's obviously not something that you could just tuck away on your desk, but all the same, it doesn't take up a lot of space. I also appreciate that it has an extra M.2 slot. I think it would have been even better if there was a 2.5 inch SATA drive as well but the M.2 is a nice touch. So now let's talk about the things I don't like. Number one is there's a lot of wasted space inside the machine. Like I just mentioned, that two and a half inch drive would have been great. And while I appreciate that there is a Thunderbolt 4 port on the back, I would have appreciated a USB-C port on the front as well. And this one's a little bit nitpicky, but I'm not a huge fan of that Skull logo here on the front. I like my designs to be nice and clean, and unfortunately that's not the case here. And finally, these NUC X models are just kind of in a weird spot. They look a lot like a vertically oriented laptop, but have a lot less functionality functionality than those. In essence, what you're doing is you're saving a couple hundred dollars by not having to buy a display and a keyboard and a mouse. And so if you already have a monitor and the other accessories and you don't plan on using this portably, then yeah, it makes sense to maybe grab this. But if you are interested in the functionality of a laptop to be able to take it on trips or things like that, that might be a better choice, even if it is a couple hundred bucks more. So in the end, what do I think about the NUC XI5? I think in terms of performance, it's pretty amazing at what it can do. If you're looking to get a desktop PC and size isn't a factor, then you can get something like my micro ATX PC for a couple hundred dollars cheaper. And if portability is important to you, then you could spend a couple hundred dollars more and get a laptop. And so this Minis Forum NUC XI5 is somewhere in the middle right there. If you want a desktop experience, but you don't have a lot of space for it, or you don't quite want to spend that premium price to get a gaming laptop, this is a good middle ground. You're either going to pay more than a traditional desktop to get a smaller space, or you're going to pay less for a laptop with a little bit more limited functionality. And so if your use case falls into that middle ground where you don't have space for a desktop PC and you don't have a need for a laptop, then yeah, I think this is a great deal. But for everybody else, given the fact that this has such a high price point, it might be to your best interest to shop around and see whether or not a desktop or a laptop would better suit your needs. Anyway, that's about it for this video. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below, and thanks to Minis for for sending out this review unit. As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.